We all love Jesus, right? Yes. Yeah. And I bet many of us, if you were to examine us, we have some sort of evidence of that on our person or definitely in our homes. And we may even have one of those fish symbols on the back of our car that says Jesus on it. You know, years ago when I was in the military, there was a Catholic chaplain who had something like that on his car, but instead of a, it had like a fish shape, but it also had little legs that had Darwin on it, which kind of insulted me because I thought it was kind of a tit for tat, you know, uh, this is Jesus, and then someone was, was uh, going against that, you know, so it kind of infuriated me a little bit, so uh, being the, the common uh, silent person I usually am, I went to inquire who might be having that in the, on their car, and it was, uh, it was the chaplain. So, uh, and I knew him pretty well, and the, chap the other chaplains were kind of having a little tit, tit for tat about him, about wanting him to take that off, and I don't exactly know what his reasoning was, but anyways, uh, and rather than going and discuss it with him myself, I decided just to remove it off his car when no one was looking. <laughs> Then a week later, he, I saw that it was replaced again, so I removed it again. And this kind of continued over a couple of months and stuff and um, until I was uh, deployed. So I was deployed overseas and I was gone and I kind of forgot about the whole thing. But when I returned from overseas, I, I happened to come home just in time for Father V's retirement and his final mass and Ginger and I did the music. And uh, so I was looking forward to his homily, thought there'd be a lot of, you know, well wishes and, and uh, you know, thank yous and that kind of stuff. But uh, actually, it kind of surprised me because instead of all that, he began to lecture us about people who play pranks on people. And uh, pranks like removing things off people's cars that they disagree with. And uh, went on to explain that how anonymous pranks uh, like that can cause one who's being pranked to be suspicious of everyone around them. And uh, so people should talk to others that they disagree with rather than covertly harassing them. Now, Father V left uh, right after Mass, so I felt bad that I didn't get an opportunity to kind of fess up and apologize, but I got over it. <laughs> didn't think about it at all for couple of years and then uh, one day I was coming back from weekend duty and I it was a uh, Saturday afternoon so I swung into the chapel they had a, they only really had confessions on that Saturday afternoon so I swung in there and uh, and knelt down to examine my conscience and and literally like a uh, like a, a storm this whole thing came up in my mind really hard I'm thinking to myself oh my goodness this is weird you know I don't think that was a big of a deal, you know? It came to me. So that was on first on my list that I was going to confess when I walked into the confessional. So I walked in, I walked around the screen to, um, uh, to confess face to face, and there was Father V. <laughs> he had returned for that weekend and he was covering confessions. We were, both were very happy to see each other, and uh, we gave each other a hug and, you know, well wished, all that kind of stuff. And uh, it was kind of awkward to me how much he seemed to really think how much of a friend I was and things like that. It really made me feel convicted because I was, had been much of a friend to him because all that things I was doing before, I didn't realize behind the scenes that he was having a war with the other chaplains and stuff and he was thinking that they were doing it. And uh, it just really caused a lot of harm to him and, and people around him. So I, I confessed to him the whole deal. And he looked stern at me for a minute, paused, and then he cracked a little smile and he said, so you're the one. <laughs> and so after that, he, uh, he broke the ice there and he, uh, and all was forgiven. Now, it's almost like uh, this encounter with Peter, with the unexpected encounter with Christ, that he approached from the, from the beach and uh, they went, got together, they ate breakfast and everything was just fine. Everybody seemed to be just, just fine, but there was something underlying there that uh, needed to be addressed. 
And of course, all was forgiven. Now, there are a few, there are a few dialogues in Scripture that can compare the depth and feelings that, uh, or the meaning of Jesus' questions to Peter. Uh, do you love me? Because love is complicated, hard to define, and even more complex to understand, especially in our modern day age when the, word, when the words I love you come in so many different ways and mean so many different things. The ancient Greeks would really be appalled by what the English language only having one word for love, while the Greeks have seven words to, to differentiate the, all the different types of love that exist. So in the gospel today in English, it may seem like Jesus is asking Peter the same question three times, but in the original Greek, they differ. The first question is actually translated more as you would say, Simon, son of John, do you agape love me more than these? Or in other words, do you love me unconditionally? Do you love me the way I love you? Do you love me more than your friends and your families, your nets, your boat, and your fishing? Even unto death? Now we have to remember this was probably the first opportunity that Peter and Jesus were able to talk alone since his resurrection or from his three times denying Jesus on, on the night of his passion. So Peter knew by these questions that Jesus knew that he was a coward and that he was unworthy to pledge such perfect love. So he simply responds, yes, Lord, you know I feelia love you. Or in other words, I have a deep sense of friendship towards you and I respect you so much. And Jesus answers, feed my lambs. Then Jesus asked Peter, do you agape love me unconditionally above everything else, even unto death, Peter? And Peter responds with the same answer. Lord, you know I feel you and love you out of my deepest sense of friendship for you. And Jesus responds, tend my sheep. And Peter, at that time, Jesus knew that he was incapable of that kind of agape, sacrificial and unconditional love for Jesus or anybody. He accepted Peter's weaknesses and reworded the question and asked Peter a little bit differently. Peter, do you philia love me out of respect and friendship for me? And Peter was distressed that Jesus had asked him the third question in a different way and in a different meaning. And Peter responded with great humility. Lord, you know everything. You know how weak and inadequate my love is for you and has been for you. But I desire to love you more. To which Jesus responded, feed my sheep. Now at the Last Supper, Peter was all, all for it, man. He was sure of himself back then. He said he would follow Jesus anywhere, even to prison or death only to, not, to deny him three times just hours later. But God never gives up on us, and he always meets us where we are. And he offers us mercy and forgiveness for our sins, no matter how many times we've turned away or denied him. He accepts any level of love that we are able to offer, however feeble, and simply asks us to follow him. So that by grace, he may magnify whatever love we offer into something glorious, like Peter's love for Christ and his church would grow from philia to agape with the help of the Holy Spirit so that Peter would come to love Jesus above everything unconditionally, even unto death on a cross upside down. That kind of love is not achieved by our own efforts, but from the love of Christ working within us as we follow him. Jesus' questions to Peter in the gospel are the same questions that he asks each of us. Do you love me beyond everything and everyone, unconditionally, even unto death? Do you love me with all your heart, 
thoughts and all your words when you talk and the way you talk to and about others? Do you love me in the way that you treat your spouse, in the way you treat your kids, in the way you treat your friends, in the way you pay and pray, or the way that you pray for instead of cursing your enemies, or in the way you freely give to others? Do you love me in the way you use your time, your talent, and your possessions, and your money? Do you love me by the things you look at on the phone or on your computer or your social media? Do you love me in the way that you pray each day for the world, for the church, for yourself and others? Or in the way that you worship me at mass or adoration? Do you love me in the way you seek forgiveness and reconciliation or the way you approach me in the most blessed sacrament at Holy Communion? Do you love me enough to share your love and faith in me, through me and with me, with the rest of the world. <laughs> now, I don't know about you guys, but some of those questions make me feel probably as about as uncomfortable as Peter felt. Because if you answer them honestly, you can't help but know that we have a long way to go to love Jesus the way that we should. But that's all right. Because Jesus accepts us where we are and asks us to follow him. Christ's love for us is so great that by the Holy Spirit, any little bit of love we humbly offer with sincere hearts to Christ, his church, and his people will grow if we only trust and follow him. Now, if you can imagine Jesus alone with you, looking you in the eye, and you think today that it would be hard to answer the question about if Jesus asked you how much you love him, how deep and how wide and how long you love him, then make it a point to follow him more closely today so that you may have a better answer for him tomorrow.